Welcome everyone to uh, this uh, IISS Shangri-La Dialogue uh, preview discussion, part of our series of uh, discussion of issues that uh, we anticipate will be uh, on the agenda or in the corridor discussions or uh, under the surface of uh, what's going on at the Shangri-La Dialogue, which we are hosting in Singapore uh, the first weekend of June. Now, um, our session this morning is on China's economic statecraft. That's a bit of a departure from the usual hard security issues that form the official agenda of the Shangri-La Dialogue. But increasingly, we see the uh, discussions in Singapore uh, incorporating the trade and economic financial aspects I seem, okay, we're on. Uh, so um, we're delighted uh, today to be able to take up these issues with two people um, who know them very well. We're going to focus on China's economic, uh, foreign, e foreign economic policy, including the Belt and Road Initiative and Beijing's enhanced focus on industrial policy to drive uh, Chinese innovations, and then the implications for the United States and uh, the rest of the world. So on my left is Charles Bustani, a counselor at the National Bureau of Asian Research and the inaugural chair holder of NBR's Center for Innovation, Trade and Strategy. Congressman Bustani retired from the U.S. Congress uh, in 2017 after serving 12 years. In the Congress, he was an acknowledged leader in the areas of trade policy, international tax policy, energy policy and foreign policy. He co-chaired the U.S.-China Working Group, the U.S.-Japan Caucus, and the Friends of TPP Caucus, and we need more friends for TPP, I'd say. <laughs> uh, to his left is Amy Selico, uh, no stranger to IISS. She uh, has uh, been coming back uh, now uh, for a couple of years. Uh, we always ask her, and we're grateful she always says yes. She's a principal of the Albright Stonebridge Group, where she leads the firm's China team in Washington. She assists clients in other East Asian markets, drawing in more than 20 years of experience on issues in the region and her experience. Uh, prior to joining the firm, she was the Senior Director for China Affairs at the, US, at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, where she was responsible for developing and negotiating positions on issues relating uh, to China's non-financial services sector and intellectual property rights. So, um, as usual, we are on the record. We're taping this for a uh, delayed um, uh, uh, attachment to our website. We'll run for an hour. We'll start off with some uh, remarks by each of the experts and then engage in our usual uh, discussion. So, Charles, if I could ask you to start, uh, I'd be grateful for your thoughts. Well, thank you, Mark. It's an honor to be here, and it's really an honor to share the stage with Amy. Uh, let me offer a sort of a 30,000 foot view of this uh, to kind of put it in strategic context. We're now 40 years out from the initial opening in liberalization efforts in China under uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, clearly during most of that period of time, it was all about economic development internally, military modernization, and keeping in mind that the party the Chinese Communist Party uh, needed to maintain its its strong position of authority as the final arbiter in decision making. And as time went on, this obviously led to um, accession to to the WTO in 2001. And there was a great deal of optimism. I remember President Cl or, uh, candidate Clinton at the time talking about uh, uh, how this would lead to further political liberalization, two way trade. Both countries would benefit immensely. And that optimism, I, I think, certainly has been um, dampened, to say, to put it mildly, uh, since that time. But I think it's fashionable today for people to disparage that decision and to say it was wrong, it was a serious mistake to bring China into the WTO. And I would argue that that's not the right way to, to look at it. The proper way to look at this is that this was a key test a key test of Chinese intention at the time. Keep in mind, the, the post-World War II architecture, uh, which has now been in place for 70 years, I believe is still a very sound architecture. And so part of that thinking was to bring this very different system in, in the hopes that we would see the economic and maybe even political liberalization over time. 
But since then, we've seen a rash of intellectual property theft. Uh, by one estimate, the IP Commission, that, uh, under the auspices of NBR, found that uh, there was some $600 billion a year of IP theft. And China's continued mercantilist practices uh, in the trade arena. But we've now seen what looks like a decided shift uh, that began prior to 2008 and has accelerated, certainly, since uh, Xi Jinping has come into power. Chinese foreign policy was mostly focused on internal development, military modernization. Now we're seeing a foreign policy that's more outward leaning, a foreign policy that is looking to expand Chinese regional and global interests. And so what Xi Jinping has done, in my mind, to prepare for this has taken steps both internally and externally. On the internal side, uh, as part of consolidation of power, we've seen the anti-corruption campaign to expand authority of the party and to, you know, to, and then creating this mythical approach to, uh, you know, Chinese virtue uh, and the virtue of the leadership of the party. Um, secondly, uh, they've taken major steps to improve unitary authority uh, over not only SOEs, which sometimes work counter to party interest, but also even in the private side uh, uh, of uh, the economy. And China is now using uh, the tools of economic statecraft, both the negative tools and the positive tools, uh, with a great deal of effectiveness. And they've discovered the utility of these tools. They clearly have learned the lessons of history. Uh, secondly, on the external side, they've, they've launched the very ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. Um, they've continued the, the, you know, the, the gathering of intellectual property through all means possible, and they continue to, to uh, flaunt the rules of, of the world's trading system where it suits their interest. Um, and they've developed uh, a much more acute use of sharp power uh, going forward as evidenced by some of the things that they've done uh, with latte and, and uh, business interest in Taiwan, tourism in Taiwan, the Japanese where they decided to cut off uh, the uh, rare earth elements uh, at one point in time. So they're using economic, uh, the economic tools of statecraft very effectively within a broader economic strategy which does fit into their grand, uh, grand strategy. Uh, in the face of this, what we've seen is a somewhere between economic, dis or I'm sorry, strategic distraction on the part of the United States uh, to, econ uh, to strategic incoherence. And we can get further into uh, what U.S. policy is or should be going forward, but I think I'll stop my comments there and uh, pass the mic on to Amy. Okay, Amy, thanks. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, Amy, I think maybe we'll be bringing us more up to date uh, with the developments in the last uh, couple of years? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for inviting me back, um, Mark, and it's great to be here with you, Charles. And I thought I would um, focus my opening remarks on the competitive elements of Chinese statecraft, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also the impacts on the region of this. Um, so I guess I would start by, I'm thinking about being in Singapore next month at Shangri-La Dialogue and having been there uh, a year ago and thinking about uh, what Secretary Mattis said a year ago, that competition with China by the United States surely will rise. He sure was right about that. Um, all of us are quite focused on uh, the prospect of a trade war between the United States and China, but I'd like to look a little bit more deeply at um, what is happening in the competitive environment between the United States and China, and, and what does this mean for, for uh, the region? So I guess um, just following up on, on what Charles laid out for us, you know, a 70-year history of, of U.S. leadership in the region, and then 40 years of China truly opening up uh, to the world, but very much, uh, as Charles said, in the hide and bide uh, framework. Over the past year, I think it's been quite uh, evident that China's economic statecraft has become much more assertive and aggressive. And I'll point to uh, three real reasons uh, for this activity. Um, Charles uh, did touch upon uh, all three of them. The first is um, after 2017 really was a year of internal focus 
uh, for the Chinese government. Um, it concluded with Xi Jinping quite successfully consolidating power at last fall's party congress and then this spring's National People's Congress, where he changed both the party and the state constitutions to give himself supreme authority and to drive political, economic, and military developments um, by reshaping the government to answer directly to the Communist Party. I think that has, in and of itself, allowed Xi Jinping to become more assertive in what he's driving at. The second is, is of course, many of us, myself included, had hoped that Xi Jinping was going to become uh, more of an economic reformer. And that hope was due in large part to the blueprint for reform that the Chinese Communist Party released four and a half years ago at its third plenum, where it was promising that the market, of course, would uh, drive capital allocation more in the Chinese economy. And those reforms, many of them never came to fruition. Instead, as Charles pointed out, Xi Jinping really focused on anti-corruption and consolidation of power over the past four years rather than economic liberalization. And it seems to me uh, at this point that Xi Jinping really does believe in the role of the party to drive economic growth and China's global integration. Um, we see this in the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as China's Made in China 2025 industrial policy plans. Um, that China, both outside of China and within China, is, is working very much on driving innovation being led and, and, and developed by the state. And the state is overseen more and more closely by the Communist Party, where, of course, Xi Jinping's predece recent predecessors um, believed in collective leadership. I think Xi Jinping has put an end to that um, recent phase of modern Chinese history. He is um, the leader of China. Others around him are his allies and uh, respond to and direct their policies very much in response to his direction. <clears throat> And then third, and I will say, of course, that's not new over the past year. Um, the Made in China 2025 policy was first released in 2013. The Belt and Road Initiative similarly is that old. It's just that over the past year, President Xi has been much more aggressive in asserting the right of China to pursue these policies for its foreign and domestic goals. And then, of course, I think the third reason, we all know this, um, for China's more assertive uh, activity over the past year has been in response to the Trump administration. I think um, the, the Trump administration, of course, has been more vocal and assertive in calling out longstanding bad Chinese behavior. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis how, how foreign investors are treated in the market, as well as uh, how China is flouting global trade rules. Uh, the Trump administration has been quite pointed in saying that China is a cheater. It's been effective in, in uh, its own domestic aims and in promoting Chinese uh, foreign policy, but it hasn't been uh, actually supportive of the international trade system that, of course, was created 70 years ago. And I think um, you know Xi Jinping, of course, sees the Belt and Road Initiative as a way of, of improving economic connectivity from China to the rest of the world. And, um, and innovation and industrial policies in helping China take its rightful place as a global leader. China wants to set rules, not take on existing rules. This is an economy that's already been extremely protectionist, as Charles was talking about, but of course is now taking on the next step of saying, we want countries to follow our way and pointing quite effectively in some cases to American protectionism as the wrong path forward. So for the Indo-Pacific region, as the Trump administration calls it, um, I think that 
you know, China is is really trying to replace physical infrastructure like <coughs> Belt and Road investments with what the United States created, which was treaties and rules-based system to follow for China to actually take in, force a choice between the United States and China, and make uh, countries choose how they are going to um, going to actually develop in the 21st <coughs> century. So I think that. Over the coming weeks and months, we're going to see, of course, a, a couple of Chinese delegations here in Washington, D.C., probably Liu He coming next week, the vice premier. Um, there's talk about Vice President uh, Wang Qishan coming this summer to the United States. The U.S. and China are certainly going to try to tamp down tensions in the trade relationship right now. But I think these competitive elements that I'm, I'm just talking about, and Charles certainly laid out first, are the ones that are really going to drive the way the United States and China are viewed within the region, and I think will certainly be talked about quite a bit uh, next month in Singapore. Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, thank you both for such uh, clear, pointed, uh, precise uh, opening remarks. Uh, uh, but since you, neither of you took the full 10 minutes I had uh, originally said you could have had, um, maybe I could uh, give you another minute or two, uh, especially Charles. Uh, talk uh, a little bit about your, your prescriptions for U.S. policy. How do we, how do we deal with this? And Amy, please uh, follow up too. Well, thank you, Mark. I, uh, I mentioned earlier that I thought the post-World War II architecture was a very sound one. It was thought through uh, carefully by many, many of our, our leaders at the time, and it served us well. And the question is, is it reasonable to depart from this or not? And I, I firmly believe we should not. First off, the system we created, our legitimacy is, is wrapped into that. And I think if we start to erode the system that's been built, we erode our own legitimacy uh, uh, internationally. Secondly, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with rules-based open trade, open investment, uh, energy security is open markets, uh, uh, diversified choices, and so forth. I, I do believe we need a flexible response. We need a response that is commensurate with the problems of the day. And the question is, what kind of scenario are we going to have uh, played out between the US and China? Will it be A, the status quo, which is clearly unacceptable, and it's getting worse. B, will China agree to the, the architecture in general terms that was created and play by these multilateral rules? And for that matter, will the US, uh, given the current state of affairs, or thirdly, uh, will we go into a sort of a binary situation of competition where um, this mercantilist approach uh, driven by China with the gravitational pull of BRI, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, will that be the attractive model that pulls in not only Central Asia, but Africa, Latin America, and even uh, Eastern and Western Europe? That's the danger. I think China's preparing uh, for that eventuality, uh, but they're going to operate within the market system that exists. So the question is, how does a, a market-based economy like the U.S. interact with this Chinese system? That's the key question. I think the flexible response, I, for want of a better term, would, engage, would include we have to rapidly engage in trade agreements, both regionally and, 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 um, and globally. We're woefully behind. The United States has 14 trade agreements. Uh, 20 countries are involved. That's outside of our WTO commitments. And the largest economy is Canada. Uh, NAFTA's on life support right now. The, the negotiations have been protracted and not going well. And uh, we walked away from TPP, and I mean, it looks like the United States has staged a global retreat. We have to get back into this game. This is also critically important because if we do go into that third scenario with an economic Cold War and a binary situation, we need flexibility and security and supply chains. You can't go into that uh, and leave all that exposed. I think um, we have to strengthen Bretton Woods, and we, need, we should take the lead in reform efforts there. I, I think we need to bring in our European partners and others, other willing partners, to play ball in this and not take steps that are actually working contrary to that. Um, 
I certainly believe we need to under, we need a strategy that will sort of lay the, the framework for how we engage within the Bretton Woods institutions, or when do we oppose China, and with whom do we oppose China uh, when they try to flout the rules? I think um, clearly internally we need to do reforms to prepare better for economic statecraft. Exim Bank is dysfunctional. OPEC, uh, OPEC uh, oftentimes has been threatened by Congress to just defund it. Uh, we need to look at, take an inventory of all these tools that can be useful in economic statecraft, strengthen them, and use them with some sense of utility uh, as part of our, our trade policy. Also, coordinating aid with trade policy and, and looking at trade capacity building. And then, let's quit alienating our allies. This is, this is self-defeating. The Section 232 steel tariffs have done more damage than, than, than help. And I think all these kinds of policies need to be looked at through a strategic lens with serious goals in mind. And, um, and I think clearly this framework I've outlined is not, not enough. It's, it's, it's a way to start thinking about the problem. And that's what Congress and that's what this administration and, and future leaders in this country who are in policymaking roles need to do. Understand the problem thoroughly understand all the facets of the problem and let's craft a strategy that uh, that makes sense to deal with it and uh, we need to be prepared for any of these three scenarios i laid out so that's why this plan needs to be flexible thanks very much charles uh, amy uh, your thoughts on policy well i i certainly agree that um, the trump administration has um, made it very difficult for us to understand what they're trying to solve for uh, with china right now in this increased competitive environment i mean certainly in the national security strategy national defense strategy our our report uh, on china's compliance with the wto this administration has been quite clear in saying china is not just a competitor it's a rival right a revisionist power uh, i think um the fact that even despite that clarity, there hasn't been clarity in how are we going to deal with it because different elements of uh, the administration have, have different uh, focus here. For example, President Trump, as we all know, on the economic side is, is quite focused on the size of our trade deficit um, with China and so is quite focused on deploying tariffs and other uh, restrictions to our market in order to remedy that that deficit. I think Ambassador Lighthizer at USTR is, is quite focused on the question um, that Charles was, was talking about and the global international trading system. I don't think he's as wedded to reforming it as you are suggesting the United States should be. I think he sees it as a system that's flawed, that doesn't necessarily help the United States. It allows countries countries like China to cheat uh, and, and manipulate uh, the system to its benefit. And so I don't think Ambassador Lighthizer has stated clearly that he sees a future for the United States in the WTO if the WTO rules against the United States in some of these quite fundamental cases that are underway right now. And then, of course, um, beyond Ambassador Lighthizer and President Trump, there's the business community. The American business community, of course, at Albright Stonebridge Group, I'm serving uh, clients who are trying to uh, trade more with China, a country that this year is likely to become the largest consumer market in the world. There's so much opportunity for American investment in that market if China allows that competition. And so the business community continues to lobby the federal government saying, don't, don't uh, don't help us lose in China by restricting um, our access to the market further because China is going to retaliate uh, against any unilateral moves that the Trump uh, administration takes. Also, don't alienate our allies because as we're pushing for greater access to the China market, we'll only be effective if, if this is a chorus of voices standing up to bad Chinese behavior, protecting its markets unfairly in the 21st century. And so um, which voices are really going to uh, rule the day? I think the president has been pretty clear that he likes to set policy 
uh, in this administration. And so it's hard for me to imagine that tariffs uh, won't be applied against China. Of course, we're looking this month at uh, a couple deadlines. The first deadline, of course, the Treasury Department needs to come up with its investment restriction um, uh, proposals in response to the Section 301 investigation. The tariffs, we're going to see, of course, hearings next week on the Hill. I don't think the Trump administration has to put tariffs in place this month, but we'll certainly likely hear from the administration what it wants to do. Clearly, they're using the threat of tariffs uh, in their negotiations with the Chinese government right now. But again, I'm not really sure, Mark, what they're trying to solve for in these negotiations. And so, you know, the, f the fearful part of me says, what if the Chinese say, okay, we'll buy $100 billion worth of LNG this year from you, and next year we'll buy $100 billion worth of semiconductors slash other product categories. So that meets your goal of a reduction in the trade deficit uh, by $200 billion over the next two years. So are we good now? That's, uh, <laughs> that, I think, it's uh, not just Amy's nightmare scenario. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, the business communities uh, because that won't help us at all with the, the restrictions that, of course, the barriers that the Chinese have uh, erected uh, to their market. And so uh, I guess uh, <laughs> stay tuned here. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, uh, for that nightmare. Uh, <laughs> before I turn to uh, others, uh, I want to pose other, one other question. And Amy, I'm going to pick up on something you said uh, uh, when you noted that uh, she has not um, you know, been the economic reformer we were hoping for, that instead of liberalization, he has uh, focused on anti-corruption and, and, and power consolidation not liberalization. Well, I, I'm sorry, you're wrong about this. I, I have it on good authority from a Chinese uh, expert at a conference I attended in New York yesterday. She gave a presentation that was all about China's liberalization. Y you would have thought that, that China is the leader. In fact, she said China is the leader in uh, promoting liberalization, and that's the whole purpose of of the Belt and Road Initiative. You're, you're giving me that look like, uh, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> well, that's what I said there. I said, oh, come on. I, I didn't put it in those words. I was diplomatic. And, uh, and, uh, but I was kind of surprised. Nobody else challenged her. And I asked uh, one of them afterwards, and why didn't you join me in challenging her? And Because well, we want to continue to get visas to go to China, was the answer. Does she have any, I mean, was there something there? Is China? Uh, embarking on a more of a liberalization path? Well, in relative terms, absolutely. China was such a closed economy 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 16 years ago, um, when it was just starting to put in place um, some of the market opening measures dictated by joining the World Trade Organization. And so, yes, when you take the long view, yes, you can say, of course, China has come very far. What makes us uh, nervous, those of us who watch Chinese policymaking today, now, not relative to 30 years ago is, you know, I, I think it's hard to continue to talk about reform. Reform is too ambiguous. Liberalization really is the word we should be referring to because China makes reforms all the time. It changed, it just uh, made an absolutely massive restructuring of the government, as massive as the restructuring in 1982. I mean, it's really going to have lasting implications for us, foreign investors working in China, as we're trying to figure out which parts of the government do we now need to work with, how does the party oversee them, uh, these new agencies and these restructured agencies. But I, I guess where I would push back on the characterization that China has become the most liberal economy in the world um, you know, a year ago, more than a year ago, President Xi um, took advantage of the protectionist trends that had not begun in the United States, I think began in Europe, and certainly the United States took them on with the, the election of President Trump. And Xi Jinping at Davos a year ago now really talked about China taking up the mantle of globalization. If other protectionist countries don't want to continue on that path, we're here to do that. President Xi gave a very similar speech in November at APEC um, about that. But many of us in the room for those speeches said, you're talking the talk. China is not walking that walk yet, despite the fact that absolutely, I think that Chinese um, official you were speaking with or academic can run down lists of changes 
Um, but when we talk about 21st century liberalizations to connect the Chinese economy more with the global economy, China has in fact continued to put up barriers there. That's what I thought. <laughs> and just a, one statistic, um, a, a poll, it's an informal statistic, but 75% of American companies polled by the American Chamber of Commerce this year said they feel less welcome in China now than before. And so those who are actually on the ground engaged are, are speaking that way. I believe them. Hmm. You know, it depends on what you mean by globalization well, liberalization. and liberalization. Uh, I, yeah. Eight years ago, I remember having conversations with Chinese leadership in Beijing about IP protections. And finally, you know, after really pushing uh, in a back and forth conversation, I got some admission that uh, in the third plenum reforms, yes, laws were, were uh, enacted, but they've not been implemented fully. Mm -hmm. And that the implementation is a problem. Five years ago, same sort of scenario with several of the leaders in China. And I was there just a few weeks ago and had the same conversations. I said, listen, I was at the foreign ministry. And I said, you guys have been promising uh, improvement on IP protections. You've been promising to give us uh, a negative list on, on the bilateral investment treaty. You've been promising more access on government procurement, uh, which is a, an obligation under the WTO, and you have not done so. So there's a, there's a profound difference between words and actions. And what I think the business community is getting frustrated with is the, the inaction, the, the lack of taking the steps to implement. And, uh, and so, yes, in one sense, Belt and Road is clearly, you know, it's a, an outward-leaning Chinese view of liberalization and, and globalization. But at the same time, there are questions about transparency in that program. What strings will be really attached to the, the aid that's given to these countries? And in the absence of other sources of investment and, and other alternatives with America's retreat from the region, we leave all these countries exposed to that, that type of system. And I think there needs to be a pushback. And I, I think for China to, to actually commit to agreed upon rules uh, and when they signed on to the WTO, they did agree upon a number of these things. They need to be, they need the pushback. They need to, to hear that this is not working the way it was intended. You're not meeting obligations. And so I feel that in terms of what should the United States do in all of this, well, we need to develop rules of engagement with regard to economic rules of engagement, I should say, with regard to how are we going to deal with these Belt and Road initiatives and these projects. AIIB was a prime example. I mean, everybody was all over the map, and, and there was a condemnation by the administration at the time without really any thought as to what should the United States do? How should we deal with it? And in fact, many of our allies jumped on board and with this, and it, 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 it just made the U.S. look feckless. This has to be, we have to have a strategic plan in mind on how we're going to interact, what those rules of engagement will be, whether it's at the WTO or with these new institutions China's proposing. There'll be times when we're going to have to oppose, and when we oppose, we need allies. When we decide, when uh, we get to agreement, then there needs to be enforcement to make sure that everybody's following through uh, on what was agreed upon, and that's been the problem. I mean, I'm still an optimist. Look, I was a heart surgeon before I went to Congress, and heart surgeons are optimists by necessity. Yeah. But I, I would say this. I'm still optimistic that we can make this work in the long run, but we have a lot of work to do, and a lot of steps have been taken uh, that have taken us backward in this relationship. And um, both sides are going to have responsibility, but both sides have to hold each other accountable in this. And I think the Chinese, in my mind, as somebody who's been watching this country and, and the reform efforts and the policies over time, they have not, they have not acted upon uh, at a fast enough pace, and in some cases not at all, on the things that they agreed to, to do. Okay. Well, thanks, Charles. Let's uh, now have some interaction. If, uh, in the usual fashion, you catch my eye, I see one here, the microphone will come to you, state your name and affiliation, even though... I should know you, maybe, but, uh, and then uh, a question, okay? Hello, my name is Eduardo Sarvale from the Center for New American Security. I had a question for both of you. On the one hand, you mentioned 
U.S. companies finding themselves cut out of the Chinese market or facing growing restrictions, and especially clashing with the government, feeling that the U.S. government feeling that it's not doing enough, and if anything, it's foreclosing its ability to reestablish itself in China. But at the same time, you mentioned the growing assertiveness showing itself in the use of sharp economic tools by China, whether Lotte Group, the Taiwan tourists, or even the past few weeks, the U.S. airlines finding themselves under fire over uh, separatist territories. I was wondering how you would put those two together, especially, and respond to that, especially given that Rio giving more access to U.S. companies might just ultimately increase their leverage over the United States in a time where China finds itself far more assertive and willing to use these tools, and especially given that the United States up to this point has developed no effective response to Chinese economic coercive measures, and so the, United, the U.S. companies might just find themselves at the mercy and <laughs> be giving Xi another tool to wield more assertively going forward. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Eduardo. Well, I think um, one tool that we have, and I wish we would use it more, is the WTO. Uh, it's a it's a tool that allows um, the U.S. China back and forth to to take a break, really, on economic issues. So, um, as a result of the 301 investigation, which if anybody has trouble sleeping, I, 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 I highly recommend reading this report. It is very well written, and it really does chronicle longstanding bad Chinese practices. The Chinese government, when I'm speaking with academics and government officials, often say, we're really open. There's nothing bad happening here. We're not forcing American companies to do this, that, or the other thing. The report really does lay out um, some of the challenges that foreign investors face in the market. And um, as a result of the 301 investigation, of course, the, the US government has proposed some unilateral action. There's potential for retaliation there by the Chinese, but also filed a case uh, at the World Trade Organization, which other countries joined about China's um, you know, uh, forced technology transfers requirement for, for um, operating in the China market and localizing data there. And I would encourage this administration to continue to use that tool because, again, it allows us not to, to be working, um, uh, distracting U.S.-China relations, but actually using the international system and allowing other actors to come in and also um, share their complaints uh, with Chinese bad behavior. It also um, is an established system, and so China can't, reset rules like um, you were saying about the airlines uh, companies. I think U.S. companies, of course, are going to want to find a way to continue to operate in China. That's why we need the government to be talking about concerns that we have about the ways China operates. U.S. companies that face restrictions in China today still find a way to work in the market. It's just likely in their medium to long term disinterest because they are transferring technology or using a joint venture partner that will eventually become a competitor of theirs. And so we need the US government and the WTO to be standing up um, for principles of openness and principles of uh, fairness in the trading relationship. I think uh, another reason that US companies aren't going to the Trump administration right now with their concerns is they're, they're a little worried about uh, retaliation against them in the United States. This administration has has you know called out uh, what they've considered bad American actors in the corporate community, and so there's concern about that as well. But I do think um, you know I was looking at the Chinese the U.S. government statement in response to the the, the airlines. Um, uh, China calling out airlines for talking about Taiwan, Macau, and, and Hong Kong as foreign countries. And um, the, the U.S. statement was kind of odd for an American, a White House press statement talking about, you know, Chinese manipulation and, and uh, of rules. It sounded actually more like something I think Beijing would issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just call on our government to stand up to Chinese bad behavior like they did through this statement. But maybe also recall that 
you know, we, we don't need to really rub China's nose in its bad behavior. We just have to, you know, stand up to principles that well predate uh, the Trump administration coming into office. And so, great idea to stand up to China. I think the execution was pretty poor in that case. Okay, thanks, Amy. You want to add to that, Charles? Yeah, very briefly. I, w I would agree with everything Amy just said. And, um, it's important to understand Chinese strategic culture and negotiating behavior as you deal with this. And the thing that struck me with the, the delegation that went over was they, they didn't seem to get that, that memo uh, going into it. But I think uh, um, you know, there's a time for publicly you know, bringing this to the forefront as the Trump administration has done, and there's a time for a lot of work to be done behind the scenes. There's also danger, and I think you, one little point you made in this was the double-edged sword of interdependence <laughs> And company, if you look at uh, the U.S.-China business reports over the last 10 years or so, I mean, the trend is pretty clear that things have gotten more sour, but companies are still out there. They're still trying by the hardest to make money, but there's a big trade-off. I think um, we have to understand the double-edged nature of this interdependence and take steps as we look at, at how to deal with it. How do we shape this environment to get us back ultimately to you know, the, the, the basic architecture that we, we espoused going back 70 years ago. It's a rules-based trade, and um, it's going to take a lot of work. This is not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to be easy. Okay, thank you, Charles. Let's bring the microphone up to the word the frontier. Uh, first of all, in the second row, um, Will Embry. Thank you. I'm Will Embry, uh, now with DynCorp uh, International. Uh, the press uh, and you today have largely focused on China's rise and uh, you know where it's sort of going up and up. Uh, I feel that there really are uh, a number of Achilles heels uh, on the uh, on China at the moment: uh, aging workforce, uh, rising wages, uh, SOE uh, inefficiencies, uh, debt overhang, uh, uh, corruption, and maybe uh, popular resistance or desire for governance. I was wondering whether you can talk about how serious these are, whether it's really, you really think it's going to uh, derail China's rise. If you can just uh, hang on to the microphone, I think we're going to go to um, Sun Jin Choi next, next. So we'll, we'll give a, a time to answer, and then you can have the question after that. So just hold on for a second. Not, not yet. Um, I agree. All, I think all those problems are very serious, and I think there's an understanding in China uh, about the serious nature of all these problems. And I think a lot of what they're trying to do is to, to counter the, the, the negative aspects of what could happen from any one of those. I still would rather have our problems than theirs at this stage of the game. But I think from a policy-making standpoint, it, it's important to recognize those issues and understand the vulnerabilities it creates and, and how we could use those in our economic statecraft. But I think it's also... Uh, important to assume that they will overcome those things and we have to have a real response if they're fully successful in what they try to do. But I do believe that all of those problems, each and every one of them constitutes a serious problem and the, and the confluence of them together, um, it, it makes a serious, you know, it, it creates a serious outlook for China. Finally, I would say that uh, by consolidating power, and this has been reported uh, by others, uh, into basically one man, one rule uh, uh, with a party imprimatur, it puts Xi Jinping in a pretty high risk situation himself. If, if he fails, it's all on him. And so um, these are things we need to consider as we look at formulation of our policy. Yeah, I really agree with that. The vulnerability when you can't really point to somebody else um, when something goes wrong is going to be tough on this administration. Xi Jinping has put his allies in so many positions of authority across the, the party and the government. I think in response to your question, I think Xi Jinping probably wakes up every morning and thinks, uh, solely about domestic issues when he thinks about the real threats uh, to the Communist Party continuing to run China. You know, the list that you uh, just ran through, absolutely. And in response, you know, he's made it um, his priority to fight three critical battles as he continues to, to characterize them. One is uh, to take out the risk in the economy um, by the over-leveraging and, of course, the, the huge debt 
that exists, the unstable debt. The second is to uh, alleviate poverty and deal with the income disparity. And the third is uh, to protect the environment better. Because these are three social stability issues for, for China. And uh, I do think that Xi Jinping, th by consolidating power over the past few years, will be able to more effectively deal with these issues. For example, two years ago, two and a half years ago now, the um, the stock exchange crisis um, the president was able to deal with. Five years ago, let's face it, the Communist Party was, was, was rotting from the inside out, and his anti-corruption campaign has cleaned that up considerably. And so I will say, um, to his credit, President Xi, when he sees problems that are going to impact uh, China's future being led by the Communist Party. He's been pretty serious and dogged in trying to resolve them. And so the issues that you just mentioned are absolutely critical issues for Xi. One more that I would add that is driving him today is the impact of a true trade uh, trade war with the United States. Because, of course, China is an exporting nation, China also continues to import critical elements uh, for its domestic development program. And so, um, you know, if things really go off the rails with the United States, and maybe the Europeans or the Japanese join the United States in putting, putting more barriers in place against China, that's bad for Xi too. Um, but I do think that's why the, the Chinese, um, in response to maybe a disorganized delegation going to Beijing last week, instead of walking out of the room in response to some pretty unreasonable asks, that the US put to the Chinese last week, um, they want to continue dialogue and try to avert really breaking down um, the trade relationship. Because in addition to that list you, you, you just gave, um, uh, having fewer markets for Chinese products is bad for China. Thanks, Amy. Um, I want to make sure to try to get to the, the six uh, people who have caught my attention. So we'll do two uh, at a time. Uh, uh, Sun Jin Che, and then two in back of you. We'll take both of you. Um, in, in this round. Good morning. My name is Sanjin Choi, Langham Partners. Thank you so much for Lucy Rin's succinct remark. Amy, I absolutely agree with you. Xi Jinping took the high road at the Davos. The problem is he didn't follow up with execution. The question is, as you point out, in order to achieve three pro uh, priorities for Xi Jinping, he need world economic growth and he need allies. As Congressman you said, the application of Section 232 with the aluminum steel is a terrible idea because we need allies, European allies, to, com to cope with it. So how would you able to, to work with the EU member states to sort out of these issues? And uh, thank you. Okay. So I didn't mean to cut you off. And if you just hold on to that uh, thought. And uh, in the young lady in the third row, yes, please. Hi, I'm a grad student from Georgetown University, major in medical policy. Uh, the question I want to ask is, the, is there a stage for both U.S. and China to have a mutual interest on it? Because a few months ago, at, uh, I was in a Bro Brookings uh, seminar, and one of the experts uh, is um, a, like re representative of uh, Ford, Ford Foundation in China. She mentioned that China, even though China wants to set the rules, as I Amy mean, and you said, China wants to set the rules, but China still lack of experience to set the rules. So. U.S. have a lot of experience in like when globalization something. So is there a state for both U.S. and China to? Okay, play so two well? questions that are both looking positively: one U.S. Uh, EU uh, relationships and one U.S. China bilateral working together. I yeah, think the is mutual the interest. So um, who wants to take uh, on? You can address one or both. Uh, Amy, go ahead, please. Let me take that second question and just say, you know, the Obama administration took your view to heart. Even though the trade frictions between the United States and China well predate the Trump administration, I think instead of using U.S.-China commercial relations as the ballast of the relationship, the stabilizing factor as tensions continue to mount, um, the U.S. and China looked to global issues that required their cooperation, whether it was climate change, Iran, North Korea, um, global health pandemics. There were a number of areas where the United States and China needed to cooperate in order to solve the world's problems. And I think that was foundational for the relationship and very positive. 
Unfortunately, in this administration, President Trump has just not prioritized many of those issues, although North Korea clearly is a, is a priority. And so we do have to look a little bit differently on where we can find common ground with China. I agree with you that there's a lot of need from both sides um, to, to cooperate on issues like North Korea or like um, uh, academic exchange, medical, uh, you know, dealing with an aging population in China is uh, one area where the United States could provide a lot of assistance. And the Chinese government has said that they're going to liberalize on Hainan Island and allow more um, duty-free um, products and services, healthcare services, into, into China, which is great for the United States. But I'll just say, um, I think as our tensions continue to mount, not just in the economic uh, way, but also on political issues, on diplomatic issues, the Ford Foundation is, is operating in an increasingly constrained way in China because of China's NGO law, NGO management law. And so that really does make finding those areas of cooperation, one, more, more, more important than ever, but two, more challenging than ever. And so I'm a little bit pessimistic on that front unless the United States comes out and China does too and says we need one another. In, in a number of areas. And I'm not hearing that coming out of Beijing as much anymore. And I'm certainly not hearing it coming out of the Trump administration either. It's worrying. I, I clearly think there are a lot of areas of commonality of interest. And um, during the Bush administration, and then subsequently the Obama administration, there was a high level dialogue established, I think under, um, uh, the la under the last administration, Obama administration, it was the strategic and economic dialogue. And that was important to set you know, some high high level goals, but then there was a process underneath that uh, at the sub ministerial level, at the working group level, which was kind of a constant interaction. That's missing right now. Uh, actually, both features are missing because even the high level dialogue is not where it, it was. Uh, uh, I mean, we're way off of that now. So reestablishing that kind of structural approach to to um, uh, solving these problems and finding the areas where we have commonality and working together on them could be uh, very helpful. Secondly, even with Belt and Road, we, we in the U.S. have some serious national interest in Central Asia. We've been involved there, blood and treasure and everything else. I think this is an area that we could maybe find some, some way to interact in a constructive way uh, with China. And it, it's worth pursuing it, but I'm not sure there's, I mean, I think we're far from that position with this administration to actually have that kind of conversation. And on your question, I think with the European Union, clearly the, the Section 232 issue uh, was a major irritant and remains so. Uh, the withdrawal from the climate agreement, whether you agree that it was a good one or a bad one, um, I mean, it's created friction. Uh, and Iran, Iran yeah, now, <laughs> yeah, which just happened. And so uh, we cannot, I, I don't think there's a, a, a good pathway to working to deal with China's, uh, you know, errant behavior in the trade world without bringing the Europeans and the Japanese and the Australians and New Zealanders and others, Koreans into this. Uh, so creating more irritants actually is self-defeating. And um, I, I don't even, I mean, even solving the steel overcapacity issue, this doesn't solve that. It actually makes, it just punts it, it pushes it over onto the Europeans and other countries. So um, I think, um, I mean, I disagree with the administration position on that. I think we need to be building out those relationships all within a broader strategy on how to deal with the, 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 the difficulties we have in the US China relationship. Okay, thanks. Um, we're kind of in the lightning round of the, uh, of the end here, and I've got three or four. Um, it, over here on the left, sir, did you have a, a question? Or, no, in the fourth row? Yeah, and then after you, we're going to take, I'm sorry, we're going to do four at once here. Okay. And can you keep all this in your head? Um, oh, well. <laughs> and, <I've had. laughs> and then we're going to pass after to, to your right. Um, Peter yeah, Rashish with Johns Hopkins University. Congressman, you just said that the U.S. needs all of its allies to help out. What if you turn that around? What if you're all these allies looking at the United States and the United States doesn't look like it's going to step up to do that kind of cooperation you mentioned? Uh, you know, are there things they can do without the United States? Uh, is that realistic? What kind of things should, th should those be? And do you, how do you think this, you, this administration would look at that? Would they look at it with benign neglect or would they look, be suspicious that other countries are trying to take the initiative? 
Um, hang on to that. Uh, pass, the, pass the microphone to your right, uh, Stanley. Uh, Stanley Kober, on Belton Road, I'm looking at an article that was published by Xinhua a few weeks ago, and it reports that seriously underf underfunded quotes of former central bank governor, the shortfall in the infrastructure investment of the Belton Road regions is over 600 billion U.S. dollars every year. That's a big shortfall. Okay, and I'll pass the microphone in the third row, gentleman on the edge here. Yep, yep, right here. Uh, thank you, Drew Hyman at CSIS. Congressman, you said that the Chinese have obviously learned from history, but if you look at the, uh, and this follows the Achilles heel question, if you look at uh, Xi's speech after in the 19th Congress recently, and I wonder if both of you could respond to this, it looks, he wants to put the, he said the party is now going to be in control of everything, education, the economy, the military, everything. He has used corruption uh, investigations to eliminate potential competitors and successors. Um, State-owned enterprises are going to be given greater role in the economy and there's going to be more lending to state-owned enterprises, even those that are under huge debt. I think we've seen that play before. Yeah. And I don't, it doesn't lead to re robust economic growth, it would seem to me. But maybe you have some feeling about that speech and how that relates to okay. Chinese growth. Okay. Thank you. Um, David Stafford here, in the, and then we'll get to you, sir, the last. I'm David Stafford. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned um, Belt and Road several times in several of the questions here, so I'll follow up with that. Um, it seems to me that um, Belt and Road looks a lot like China's um, work program that he had in Africa. You know, it does not seem like a cooperative relationship with the stands as they cross and may build their new Silk Road. Uh, this is a great place to use Brenton Wood institutions. This would be a great way to push back and to get Russia and China looking at each other rather than trying to disrupt us in the Middle East and in the Pacific. Can you talk a little more about how we can bring power to bear out of our old institutions from 70 years ago into how we can take more control out of uh, Central Asia? Thanks, David. And yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I, I do apologize. I, I did tell this gentleman in the third okay. row I would give him the last word from the floor. Very generous, Mark. Thank you. Brian Pollins from Ohio State University. China moving into a role of global economic leadership. Historically, nations that take on that mantle or move into that position uh, have had something which China conspicuously lacks, and that is a currency which is convertible and serves as a reserve currency in the global trading system. The fact that China does not have such a currency, do you see that as much of an impediment to China's ambitions? Is China going to make their currency convertible in the foreseeable future? Uh, what's, what's up with that? Okay, thanks, Brian. So there are five questions here. You don't have to deal with all of them, but they're all good questions. So if you, if, if you together could. One, um, can others take the initiative to, uh, to deal with these issues? And uh, how would the United States uh, uh, react to that? Two questions about Belt and Road. One is the shortfall in the investment. The other is that it looks like what we saw in Africa is Bretton Woods uh, a, a way to push back. Uh, and then the question about, uh, to you, Congressman, um, uh, the Xi's speech at the 19th Party Congress of uh, consolidating control. And finally, um, uh, China not having a convertible currency that can, can serve as a reserve currency. Uh, how about that? I agree. That, that is a... a, a um, a vulnerability on the currency issue, but they're dipping their toe into the water on this and looking for ways to internationalize the renminbi, whether they'll be successful or not, and how long that could take. I think they've got a lot of problems ahead uh, as I look at this. Uh, with regard to Belt and Road, I believe um, uh, clearly there's a shortfall, and that's the that's the that's the weakness in this plan. Can they execute? And that's that remains uh, a serious question as to whether they can do it. I do agree. It looks a lot like what they did in Africa, and um, it's an ambitious, grand plan. I think there's a lot of skepticism as to whether this uh, could be carried out, but uh, it's certainly we need to be wary of it and understand how we're going to interact. And I think it gets to your question about this is. I think I agree with you. This is a perfect place for a rejuvenation of the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, bringing in multilateral help, and this is going to require American leadership. That's going to be problematic. On the question with regard to uh, 
uh, Xi's speech and did they really learn lessons of history? I think they learned some short-term lessons of history and you know that led to the demise of the Soviet Union, better use of economic statecraft, adopting certain market characteristics, but they failed to, uh, to learn one key lesson, autocracies and auto autarkies don't work. Um, and, and finally, keeping the U.S. out of Asia is not going to be something that will work. So I, 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 I didn't mean to say that they learned all the lessons of history. I think there's serious vulnerabilities in doubling down on this, this party state approach and now unitary authority in the, in the uh, person of Xi. And on the last one, I would say that um, I think of Japan with the U.S. departure from TPP, Japan really stepped up along with the Australians to keep the uh, TPP-11 effort alive. It was clearly in their interest to do it. it certainly, it was in ours for them to keep this foothold there and leave a docking station for the U.S. to come in. Japan did, a, I think, a wonderful job in putting the IP and, and, and investor protections in a state of suspension to hold that docking station for the U.S. Otherwise, the countries would have eliminated those and it would have made our reentry even much more difficult. So um, I hope I you did. You got touched to your, on everything. Yeah. That was great. How, how, how we could do this with the Bretton Woods institutions will take a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving some thought to that. Amy, uh, you get the last bars and then bring it home. Um, I guess I'll just, I, I really do agree with how you characterize so many of those responses. I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the one, can our allies go at it uh, alone without us? Uh, you know, I think a report was just sent to Xi Jinping uh, by 27 of the 28 EU ambassadors uh, to, to China, to Beijing, highly critical of the Belt and Road Initiative and the impact that BRI, the adverse impact BRI is having on their markets. And so, you know, and this comes back to the last question or also, um, I, I do think there are considerable problems that EU member states face with China that, that they are just waking up to. And so despite our significant differences and the 232 being really a, a thorn uh, that the European and Jap Japanese economies have to deal with, with the United States, they do still want to work with us on standing up to some, some long-standing bad practices by the Chinese government that I think um, many in the European Union are waking up to requires a more proactive um, response. So for example, restrictions, a CFIUS-like system in Europe, uh, joining our WTO case that we just filed on the forced tech uh, transfer data localization requirements with China. And so I do think they're really, um, while our allies certainly could go it alone, it's hard. You know, Macron, I'm sure when Merkel was here, they talked about China as well. It's very difficult for us individually to stand up to these Chinese um, behaviors because there's a lot of incentive uh, to continuing to accommodate China. Um, but I do think that with many of our like-minded partners, despite U.S. policy that, that's causing a lot of grief, um, we need to work together rather than just allowing our allies to go, go it alone without us. And I think that is one area of commonality that we do share, that we need to find a way forward on that. And then on the, on the Belt and Road, just one, one final statement on that. I, too, am wondering how the Bretton Woods system can, can effectively compete with Belt and Road. The statistic from the back that the massive infrastructure needs uh, that Belt and Road Initiative is trying to take on are, com are not going to be met by Chinese um, state capital. And so there is going to be unfair uh, practices put in place because Chinese companies and global companies that participate in Belt and Road projects are going to want to get repaid. And the Chinese government will take advantage if countries aren't going to pay them back by, you know, taking over the port. Uh, uh, and, and that will further alienate China uh, when China, again, is trying to use the Belt and Road Initiative in a geostrategic way to, to, to sh demonstrate that it can be an alternative to the United States, I do not think China is, effective, is necessarily going to be effective with that. You know, to the questioner who said there are so many challenges um, uh, that Xi Jinping must face, that's another one of them. This is his 
signature initiative. The government is not going to back away from it. But in this government restructuring that was just announced in March, they did take Belt and Road away from NDRC and put it in this new agency. Because I think they recognize there are a lot of problems with Belt and Road so far. And, and for, you know, it's been written into the party charter, and so it needs to be successful. But it's going to be very difficult for it to be successful if it isn't more competitive uh, in the future. Thanks so much. I think we've had a very good uh, discussion of the strategic implications of China's economic statecraft as the first of our uh, discussion series leading up to the Shangri-La Dialogue. I think this was an excellent forum because of the excellence of the speakers. Uh, please join me in thanking Amy and Charles. And we're definitely going to have you back. And Charles, if we can get you back again, sure. that would be great. So thank you very much. Thank you.